Those who live in the Maritimes and make their living from the sea know that danger and disaster are an ever-present threat that must be calculated into a day's work. Often, their doom is already sealed, and nature and greed will ensure that many will not return home. March 13, 1914. A fleet of ships is preparing to leave St. John's Harbor on the southeastern coast of Newfoundland. Disaster is far from the minds of the men eager to head out to sea and reap the bounty of the spring seal hunts. For over 100 years, men and ships have been leaving this harbor in early spring, headed for the ice patches of northern Newfoundland and southern Labrador. Another sealing season is about to begin. In the lead is the SS Stefano, the largest and grandest ship of the fleet. It was uh, something over 2,000 tons and um, used as a passenger steamer to Halifax and New York and so on. But during the sealing season, they would board over the decks and it would be sent out to the ice. At the helm is the legendary Abram Keane, the greatest sealing captain of them all. He was a very rigid, very uh, puritanical uh, old man who was enormously successful at the work he was doing, which was killing and bringing in seals. The men were all afraid of him, with almost no exceptions, and these included the officers on the ships. Abram is not the only keen leaving St. John's that day. His oldest son, Joseph, is captain of the Florizel, the second largest steamer in the convoy. The Florizel was the first sealer to use wireless telegraphy five years earlier. In 1914, all the ships leaving the harbor are outfitted with this new technology. All except one. The SS Newfoundland is the largest of the wooden walls and the oldest. The Newfoundland was an old wooden steamer, 40 odd years old and uh, slow. She didn't have the power to force her way through the ice fields the way the Stefano and the Florizel did. The master of this particular wooden wall has the added pressure of being the son of the legendary Abram Keane. Westbury Keane is just starting his fourth season as ship captain. Westbury was one of his youngest sons, he was probably the least experienced of the Keane's family. 21 ships and 3,700 men leave port. Some of those men have just over two weeks to live. Tuesday, March 31st, 1914. A group of ships from the sealing fleet are working the ice patches 72 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland. Two more ironclads, the Bellaventure and the Bonaventure, are a few kilometers away, pushing their way through the heavy ice. The only ship not moving is the SS Newfoundland. The wooden wall has been jammed in the ice for over a week now its crew only able to bring in 400 pelts since the season began. Even a young sealman like Cecil Moland can see the effect this has on his captain, Westbury Keane. They used to climb the rigging uh, two and three times a day with a spike glass up in the barrel, they called, on the, on the, on the masthead. And he used to scan the old ocean and they see a steamer, he'd think, uh, you're not sure, they may be. He may be killing seals there, and, and all he wanted was to get into a patch of seals. He wanted to make a name for himself like his father. It is his father who offers a solution. Captain uh, Abram Kane had told Westbury that if he found the seals, he would raise the after Durvik. And if Westbury saw this, he would know that the seals were in the presence of the Stefano. So by March the 30th, with the season coming to an end, he saw the Durick being raised on the Stefano. The lack of a wireless makes it impossible for Westbury Keane to communicate directly with his father or the other ships. He orders his men to walk the 10 kilometers to the Stefano and get directions to the sighted seal herds. He puts George Tuff in charge. 
Uh, George Tuff was second hand on the, on the Newfoundland. He was an extremely experienced, very experienced sealer. He'd been to the ice many times. He had a great record of getting seals. George Tuff and his crew of 160 men make their way across the ice patch towards the SS Stefano. The weather is still mild, and many of the men have exchanged their heavier outerwear for lighter clothing. They wore whatever they had. They had heavy mitts and they had sweaters on under jackets and some things of this sort, but they weren't what you would call dressed for Arctic conditions. As they move across the ice, several of the crew notice a bank of thick clouds forming to the north. The weather continues to thicken. Around 10, some of the men decide to return to the Newfoundland. They sensed that there was a storm coming and about 132 in all continued on. After a four and a half hour trek, George Tuff and his crew finally reach the Stefano. Many of the Newfoundland crew assume they are staying aboard that night, but Captain Abram Keane has other plans. He tells George Tuff that he is taking them to a herd of 1,500 seals on a patch three kilometers closer to the Newfoundland. This way, Tuff and his crew can return to their ship when their work is done. George Tuff would never have believed that Captain Kane could do anything stupid or anything wrong. This man, Captain Abram Kane, was regarded as just a little bit below God. So Tuff would have assumed that the old man was doing the right thing. Cecil Moland and the Newfoundland crew have barely finished their hard bread and tea before Captain Keane orders them off his ship. When we got our cup of tea, he was hollering, over the side, over the side. He keep on saying that some fellas uh, got kind of afraid of him or something, and they went down in a hurry. Yeah. So he put us out and told us to go on and pan sails and then walk to our own ship. And we was about six or seven miles from the Newfoundland, you know, and that's a long walk. Captain Abram Kane must have known that there was a, there was threatening weather when he put the men on the ice, but he believed they were close enough to the ship to get back to it. It is almost 12 noon. As the Stefano steams away, George Tuff directs his men to a patch of seals several kilometers away. Sealer Jacob Dalton and the rest of the Newfoundland crew can barely see their own ship in the distance. I've heard him say that uh, he knew then that there was something going to happen there, right? They never, they'd never even make it back, because as they kept on going, the weather got worse, and then the wind started to pick up, and then they couldn't see where they were walking. A real blizzard. George Tuff was a very experienced second hand, but he seems to have been unwilling to challenge authority or challenge orders. He had been told by Abram Cain to kill the seals before returning to the ship. He looked on, upon that as an order that could not be disobeyed. In less than a half hour, the weather is so bad that they decide to forget the seals and head for their ship. Had they stopped where there were seals they had killed that morning, they could have uh, built a reasonable shelter and they would have had the seal pelts to burn and they'd had the seal meat to eat. But of course, they headed uh, for the Newfoundland, even though they knew they were at least four hours away from it. Four hours away, the 34 men who turned back earlier that morning arrive at the Newfoundland. When some express concerns to Captain Westbury Keane that the rest of the crew is caught somewhere between the Stefano and their own ship, he assures them that he has seen the men board the Stefano and that his father will look after them. On board the Newfoundland, Westbury was convinced that his men were on board the uh, Stefano, and uh, on board the Stefano, uh, Abram Kane, he assumed that the men had made it back to the Newfoundland, but they had no way of contacting each other. Meanwhile, they were all out freezing to death. Tuesday, March 31st, 1914. The island of Newfoundland is at the mercy of the worst storm of the winter. The storm breaks so viciously that it blows open the doors at the home of school teacher Jessie Collins. She can only hope that her sweetheart, Cecil Moland, a sealer working on the SS Newfoundland, 
is safe. 72 kilometers off the island's northeast coast, the spring sailing fleet is battling the same storm. Captain Westbury Keane of the SS Newfoundland assumes that his crew of 130 men are safe aboard his father's ship, the SS Stefano. He assumes wrong. The men are several kilometers away, trying to follow their own path back to the ship, led by second-hand George Tuff. He used to say, keep on going and keep the wind in the side of your face. But the wind was gradually changing up. And then, after dark, we was going around in circles. We didn't know where we were going, because the wind was changing all the time. With the darkness, the men have no choice but to find shelter. The type of shelter they could build was very limited. The best they could hope to do was to build a wall. It wasn't much protection because uh, with the rain, it didn't help at all. By midnight, with temperatures falling fast, none of the shelters can protect them from the wind either. The major protection really came from the men themselves who had the strength to keep going and to stay alive. Cecil Moland uses the image of sweetheart Jesse Collins to help keep him going. Ironically, the leader of his group is also named Jesse Collins, a veteran who encourages his men to use exercise to battle the cold. Jesse Collins tried to get men to pretend that they were walking in a circle and pounding each other on the back and that to try to keep circulation going. Wednesday morning, April 1st. Winds are so powerful that the men fear being blown off the ice. To make matters worse, some of their shipmates have not survived the night. Some lie dead and frozen on the ice pans where they fell. On the SS Newfoundland, Captain Westbury Keane still believes his men are on the Stefano. When the weather clears at noon, he steams towards his father's ship before getting jammed in the ice two and a half kilometers away. Not far away, crews from the Bella Venture are panning seals on the ice floes. Secondhand Abram Parsons sees the men in the distance and assumes that they too are working the ice fields. During the second day on the ice, some of the ships were visible but distant. The other ships were not close enough to see a party of men on the ice but they were close enough so the party of men could at least see the sealing ship. Some of the men are already on their way toward it. But just when the Bella Venture appears to be steaming towards them, it suddenly veers away in the opposite direction. Second-hand George Tuff catches sight of the Stefano and tells the men that Captain Keane is finally coming for them. He watches until the Stefano also turns away. There is one ship left, their own, jammed in the ice about three kilometers away. Night is falling as Tuff and a few men head toward it. They could see the Newfoundland, and as some of them walked towards the Newfoundland, the Newfoundland broke free and steamed away from them. As another freezing night sets in, those who live through Tuesday's storm begin to surrender themselves to exhaustion, desperation, and the bitter cold despite attempts by veteran sealer Jacob Dalton to keep members of his group alive. He just go and pick them up and shake them and keep talking to them, oh, you're all gonna be okay. And he had a strong nerve and a strong will to live. He kept a nice few people alive, talking to them by, you know, getting them up. In his group, Cecil Moland can only watch as friends and shipmates die around him. And some fellers that didn't want to die, you know, they really died hard, and they fought till the very last minute. Sealer James Donovan is so used to seeing men die around him that when his own brother Stephen finally succumbs, he is unaffected, pausing only long enough to take his brother's cap for his own. Those still able to comprehend what is happening try to hold on to anything that will pull them through. For Cecil Moland, it is the New Testament given to him by sweetheart Jesse Collins, 
and the burning need to see her again. She loved me so much, she gave me that uh, before I went to the seal fishery in 1914 and said, keep it in your vest pocket always. And I tucked it in my vest pocket. Thursday, April 2nd, 1914. The morning is cold, frosty, and clear. Captain Westbury Keene finds a break in the ice and steams the SS Newfoundland towards the Stefano, intending to pick up his crew. Westbury Keane was up in the crow's nest and moving his spyglass idly around, he saw a couple of men staggering towards his ship. One of the men is his second hand, George Tuff, snow blind and barely alive. Nine more follow in the distance. Westbury Keene immediately puts up a distress signal. Captain Abram Keene sends two men aboard the Newfoundland and discovers for the first time that the crew he let off on Tuesday did not reach their ship. The Stefano makes its way through the heavy ice in search of survivors. It is said that Keene stops to pick up seal pelts along the way. He was uh, picking up men, pulling men on his ship on one side and, and and pulling seals in on the other. At the same time, spotters on another ship in the area, the SS Bella Venture, report seeing more of the men approaching their ship. Once on board, the men report more than 50 dead where they were earlier that morning. The Bella Venture immediately sends out a search party with food and supplies. I mean, what they found was uh, horrifying because uh, the frozen men you know, in some cases, were clinging together. Some of them froze onto the ice, and, and they couldn't get them. They had to bring them a trunk of ice and all uh, on stretchers when they finally got around to rescuing these people. Word quickly spreads to all ships in the sealing fleet that 70 dead men have been pulled from the ice. Eight more are missing and are never recovered. All the bodies are put on board the Bella Venture, which steams for St. John's Harbor. Crews on many of the other ships feel they should follow, abandoning the seal hunt out of respect for the dead. Saturday, April 4th, 1914. The SS Bella Venture enters St. John's Harbor, its flag at half-mast. There were thousands of, of people from St. John's down on the waterfront to see this happen. And there was nothing but dead silence when they started bringing the, the bodies and the living ashore. And there was no feeling of outrage until later when they discovered who had been involved in causing the, the disaster. Many feel that Captain Abram Keene is responsible, that he never should have let the men off with a storm brewing. In a letter to a local newspaper, Captain Keene offers no apology or acceptance of guilt saying that anyone who goes sealing must accept the risks that go with it. For Captain Westbury Keene, the true cause of the tragedy is clear, the lack of a wireless aboard the Newfoundland. The, uh, the one responsible for the man once they got to the Stefano, of course, was Captain Abram Keene, not Westbury. He was the, the one who abandoned them on the ice, believing they could walk back to their own ship. Despite letters and petitions demanding Abram Keene's dismissal and arrest, a sealing commission inquiry cannot agree on the cause of the tragedy, finally calling it an act of God. Many sealers, including Jacob Dalton, will blame Keene for the rest of their lives. I've heard him say uh, lots of times that it was his fault and he got a scotch-free he got away with it. The season of 1914 is the worst in Newfoundland sealing history. 78 men die on the ice patch. Some of the survivors lost both feet, so that there were quite a number of people who were disabled for life. Many of them never went back to sealing again. After this happened this year, he still went to the seal fishery. The next year, he was back at it again. Eh? Oh yeah, he won't. He won't give up.
But there was enough there to see all them people die to just, you know, forget that. I ain't going back at no, but he just kept at it. One of those who does not return to sealing is Cecil Moland. Cecil Moland not only survived, he went home and he married Jessie, his sweetheart, the one he was determined to live to marry, and was still living with her 50 years later. I think the long-term effects for the disaster would have been that uh, sealing was no longer regarded as uh, a responsibility for the individual sailor. <clears throat> it became much more the responsibility of the government and the responsibility of the captain, so that the seal hunt became a much less haphazard affair than it was. They immediately began putting wireless aboard all ships, for instance. They realized that had there been wireless aboard the Newfoundland, it wouldn't have happened. There is no memorial for the sealers lost on the ice in March of 1914 save for the reminiscences of shipmates and families left behind. The survivors are all gone now, just a memory themselves. Cecil Moland died in 1978, but he, like those trapped on the ice with him, lived with the experience for the rest of his life. I'm surprised sometimes. I, I look at myself. I, I look at myself and I talk to myself in the mirror, you know, because I... How did you ever manage to, to come to that terrible land disaster?